Well, greetings to all our brethren around the world and, and those who are online, and welcome to our guests. We have one guest here, a family from Big Sandy, Texas, uh, so that's kind of special. As you heard in the announcements, we had a very profitable Council of Elders conference this week, and uh, it's very encouraging to have person-to-person -person meetings uh, with men from various areas around the world and to see what God is doing and, and working with his work around the world. Uh, three weeks ago, we observed Pentecost, and uh, we rejoice in our calling as first fruits of the establishment of the Church of God in 31 AD. And we thank God for the power uh, that he gives us through his Holy Spirit. We discussed four aspects of God's Spirit that weekend and how it powerfully affects our lives. In today's sermon, we'll review some lessons from the days of unleavened bread and the power that God gives us through his spirit, which we discussed Pentecost weekend. The title of the sermon today is The Power to Overcome. The Power to Overcome. When we look at the annual festivals, we know it's God's master plan. We have a sermon by that title, uh, God's Master Plan Before Time Began. We know that God's festivals begin with the Passover. That's the time of a memorial of Christ's death. If you turn to uh, 1 John 1 and verse 7, it's such an encouraging scripture that I think of often when we realize we memorialize Christ's death and that his blood covers our sins. And uh, 1 John 1 verse 7 but if we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship one with another, with one another, and the blood of Jesus Christ cleanses us from all sin. What a fantastic, wonderful truth that is, that we can be cleansed from all sin. Of course, that means we have a requirement of having a repentant attitude at times, and the humility we heard about in the sermonette as well. So we start off with the memorial of Christ's death, and then we come to the days of unleavened bread. Uh, my wife and I had an inspiring last day of unleavened bread weekend in uh, Bluefield, West Virginia. And as you drive up there on Interstate 77, uh, just a beautiful countryside that, is memorial, that reminds you of the millennium. But one of the major lessons we learned from the days of unleavened bread is the need to overcome. In fact, the old uh, Ambassador to College Bible Correspondence lesson says, your part in God's plan, the days of unleavened bread. We just heard in the announcements about, from uh, the world ahead about the uh, council meetings, and uh, Mr. Frank was reading this statement. This calls for us to be discerning of our thoughts, attitudes, and emotions. Satan is stirring up hatred and division. We must recognize his devices, resist, and overcome his broadcasting. Yes, the message of overcoming is a major lesson of the days of unleavened bread. In fact, uh, I hope you had the uh, latest Living Church news. Of course, that's the May-June issue uh, with Mr. Weston's uh, editorial or dear friend, keep your lamps filled with oil. Keep your lamp filled with oil. And of course, he, in this, this article, of course, in this magazine, is a Pentecost featured uh, articles. I hope you've read them all, or most of them. We have uh, the Better Than Phylacteries by Mr. Weston, Stir Up the Holy Spirit by Mr. Meekin, The Chief Propagandist by Paul Kearns. Uh, that really is an amazing uh, article showing Satan's devices that we must, of course, overcome Satan. Uh, the Tale of Two Pentecosts by Mr. Smith. Uh, the Purpose of Speaking in Tongues by Phil Senna. So if you've not read those articles, this is the current May-June Living Church News. Uh, please read those articles, very inspiring and very helpful. So again, one of the major lessons of the Days of Unleavened Bread is to replace human nature with divine nature. And uh, Mr. Tomac's sermon reminded me <clears throat> of uh, 
Proverbs 15, one situation uh, 59 years ago when I was in, in Virginia. I was uh, working with the Regional Planning Commission. I was just coming back uh, from the bus stop to my apartment and this uh, on a rural kind of a country road next to a, a lake. And this little boy started throwing rocks at me. And I said, is he really throwing stones at me? I guess he is. <laughs> so I grabbed his hand and, and uh, dropped the pebbles. And uh, at that time, his father came along in an El Dorado Cadillac convertible. He's a big husky guy. And he said, you, did you touch my boy? And I said, I was, I was throwing, he was throwing stones at me. And of course, I've been a football player, and even though this guy was bigger than me, and I was gone, I'm going to go on. But I had been reading Proverbs 15:1 that day, and I, I said, I started to go towards him, and I said, "I'm sorry, sir." And then he said, "Well, don't touch my boy again," and that def that diffused the whole situation. So that was a lesson only 59 years ago when I prob Proverbs 15, 15:1. <laughs> but thank you, Mr. Tomac, for for that sermon, that very effective when you think about the humility of Abigail and how she averted such a big conflict and crisis. So we have to replace human nature with God's nature. We have to overcome Satan's broadcasting as Mr. Weston uh, wrote in the world ahead. And we need to overcome that chief propagandist. One of the major lessons of the days of unleavened bread is again to replace human nature with God's divine nature. So what lessons did we learn during the days of unleavened bread? I just want to review two of them. Number one is that we follow Christ daily. If you turn to Exodus, the 13th chapter, we follow Christ daily. It's amazing when you look at what happened during the 40 years of the Exodus. Exodus 13, and we'll start with uh, verse 19. Exodus 13, 19. And Moses took the bones of Joseph with him, for he had placed the children of Israel under solemn oath, saying, God will surely visit you, and you shall carry up my bones from here with you. So they took their journey from Succoth and camped in Etham at the edge of the wilderness. Verse 21, Exodus 13. And the Lord went before them by day in a pillar of cloud to lead the, lead the way, and by night in a pillar of fire to give them light so as to go by day, by, by night, as to go by day and night. The Lord was in them, and the Lord went before them. The Eternal went before them. That was the one who became Jesus Christ. What an amazing lesson. He was with them for how long? 40 years. You read the end of the, the book of Exodus, and at the end of the 40 years, he was still leading them. Of course, they didn't follow all the time. But that's one of the lessons that we should learn from the days of unleavened the bread, that we need to follow Christ, even though they did not, as they should have. Of course, they followed them physically. Uh, when the whole camp moved, uh, they moved in an orderly fashion from one point to another one. But we need to follow Christ day by day. And that lesson is emphasized in Hebrews, the 12th chapter, and verse 1. Hebrews 12 and verse 1. I'm sure you have this marked. We uh, quote this scripture from time to time. Hebrews 12, verse 1. Therefore we also, since we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses, let us lay aside every weight and the sin which so easily ensnares us, and let us run with endurance the race that is set before us. And who's going to lead us? Who led the Israelites for 40 years? Looking unto, Israel, looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and has sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. Yes, we need to run the race with endurance, and we're always looking unto Jesus as the one who is leading us. So one of the lessons of the days of unleavened bread is to follow Christ daily. Another lesson of the days of unleavened bread, of course, you know, is to put out the leaven of malice and wickedness and ingest the unleavened bread of sincerity and truth. 
which as again is symbolic of replacing human nature with God's divine nature. And I read this quite often to you in sermons, but let's turn on to 2 Peter 1 and verse 2. 2 Peter 1 and verse 2. Grace and peace be multiplied to you in the knowledge of God and of Jesus our Lord. Uh, grace and peace, uh, how much value do you put on that? As his divine power, and we'll be talking about power today, as his divine power has given to us all things that pertain to life and godliness through the knowledge of him who called us by glory and virtue by which have been given to us exceedingly great and precious promises. Not just great promises, but exceedingly great and precious promises that through these you may be partakers of the divine nature, having escaped the corruption that is in the world through lust. Uh, three weeks ago, we had a sermon on the miracle of conversion. And the, what a miracle it is when you see the change of dramatic change in the nature of someone like Saul who was persecuting the true church. And you see the change in the nature of the brothers of Jesus, James and, and Jude, who, who were actually kind of slandering him and yet uh, became uh, writers of the New Testament epistles, James and Jude. A dramatic change of nature from human nature into divine nature. And we are partakers of that divine nature through those God's precious promises. So those are two lessons we remember and review from the days of unleavened bread. And then we came to the day of Pentecost, the Pente day of Pentecost, the day of the first fruits, the beginning of the New Testament church, and the begettal of children through the Holy Spirit, the gift of the Holy Spirit, which Jesus said, remain here until what? Till power comes upon you, not a person, uh, but the power of the Holy Spirit was come upon you. And so, in the sermon I gave three weeks ago on the miracle conversion, we reviewed four aspects of the power of God's Spirit. And I'll just review those briefly, and of course there'll be uh, summarized points rather than in a full exposition. But what are some of the powerful ex uh, characteristics of God's Holy Spirit which he's given you? And I think it's good for you to understand the power that is available to you. One of them is the power of creation. What did God's Spirit do? It was Psalm 104 and verse 30. You know, it was actually the recreation. Psalm 104 verse 30 says, You send forth your spirit. They are created, and you renew the face of the earth. That was the renewed creation that we read about in Genesis 1 and verse 2. And it's the power by which Christ upholds the universe. Turn to Hebrews 1 and verse 1. This is so encouraging to me. When you think about the power of our Savior. Hebrews chapter 1 and verse 1. Hebrews 1 verse 1. God, who at various times and in various ways spoke in this way to the fathers by the prophet, the past, has in these last days spoken to us by his Son, whom he has appointed heir of all things, that's uh, panton in the Greek, through whom also he made the worlds. And that, uh, the, the, or in other words, the universe who being the brightness of his glory and express image of his person and upholding all things by the word of his power, upholding all things by the word of his power. You realize what power that is? You think of two billion galaxies and Christ is upholding the, those two billion galaxies? And then down to the finest uh, atom and nuclear and uh, the electronic elements and nucleus. You know, and he knows from the largest to the smallest. And he knows every hair on your head and my head. 
upholding all things by the word of his power. When he had himself purged our sins, sat down at the right hand of the mighty, of the majesty on high, having become so much better than the angels, as he has inheritance obtained a more excellent name than they. Yes, he is his begotten son of God, and we are his begotten son. So when you think about God's Holy Spirit and, and the lessons of Pentecost, God has given us power, and it's a power that Christ uses to hold, uphold the universe, and it's the spirit of creation. It's also the spirit of begettal. You, if you are receive God's Holy Spirit, you are begotten son or daughter of God. You're going to turn to James, the first chapter. Of course, one of the lessons of the day of Pentecost as well. Where we have James, the first chapter. James 1. Get here for for me. James one and verse seventeen. Every good and gift, perfect gift, every good gift and every perfect gift is from above and comes down from the Father of lights, with whom there is no variables or shadow of turning. Verse eighteen. Of his own will he brought us forth from the word of truth that we might be a kind of first fruits of his creatures. The King James has it better. Of his own will, he begat us with the word of truth. Yes, the spirit of God is a spirit of begettal. In the Greek word in 1 John, it's sperma. So he's begotten us his very sons and his daughters. And that's one of the characteristics of God's spirit. He's called us sons and daughters in 2 Corinthians 6 and verse 18 of the Almighty. And you shall be my sons and daughters, says the Lord Almighty. That's Second Corinthians 6 and verse 18. It's also the spirit of the resurrection. Turn to Romans, the eighth chapter. Romans 8. And to realize God has given you this gift. It's an awesome gift. Romans, the eighth chapter and verse 11. But if the spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead dwells in you, that the spirit of the resurrection, he who raised Christ from the dead will also give life to your mortal bodies through his spirit which dwells in you. What a powerful aspect of God's spirit he's given us to us. And then we go on to Another aspect of the power of God's Spirit, and that is truth. John 17, 17, your word is truth. And John 16, verse 13. John 16 and verse 13. However, when he, the Spirit of truth, has come, or when, when the Spirit of truth has come, it, uh, it will guide you into all truth, for it will not speak of its own authority. But whatever he hears, he will speak, and he will tell you things to come. And so here he tells you that God's Spirit reveals you, reveals to you prophecy, things that are to come to pass. But he will guide you also into all truth. And uh, we also heard uh, in one of the announcements, uh, John, well, maybe that was a sermon at John 8, verse 32, you shall know the truth and the truth shall make you free. So God has given us those aspects, that power from his Holy Spirit. But one of the most important powers is the power to overcome. And again, that's the title of the sermon today, The Power to Overcome. You return to Ephesians, the fifth chapter, Ephesians 5. And here we have an exhortation that tells us that we are not to neglect God's Holy Spirit. Ephesians, the fifth chapter. Ephesians 5, we'll start with uh, verse 15. Ephesians 5 and verse 15. 
See then that you walk circumspectly, not as fools, but as wise. Uh, again, applying the uh, proverb we heard in the sermonette. Verse 16, redeeming the time because the days are evil. You know, it's, uh, I have the opportunity to have a uh, CD player in my car, and I was just listening to Mr. Weston's sermon from last year on uh, two ways of life, the way of give, the way of get, uh, the way of the two trees, the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, and the tree of life, uh, the two ways of life. And you redeem the time. I'm able to redeem the time when I'm driving around listening to a sermon. So that you need to find ways uh, to redeem the time. Redeeming the time because the days are evil. Therefore, do not be unwise, but understanding what the will of the Lord is. Verse 18, a very important verse. Perhaps you have it marked in your Bible. And do not be drunk with wine, in which is dissipation, but be filled with the Spirit. So God, if you pray according to God's will, we know that we have the petition that we desired of him, it tells us in 1 John, I believe it's 3.22 or somewhere along there. We're praying according to God's will. He wants you to be filled with the Holy Spirit. And when you read in the, the circumstances around Jesus' birth and his going up to the temple, and it would, would say that uh, Zacharias was filled with the Spirit. So God says to be filled with the Spirit, speaking to one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing and making melody in your heart to the Lord, giving thanks always for all things to God the Father in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, submitting, as uh, Mr. Tomac quoted the scripture, submitting to one another in the fear of God, Ephesians 5, verse 21. And so that's, those are the examples and the attributes of being filled with God's Holy Spirit. And we know that in 2 Timothy 1, verse 7, that God has not given us the spirit of fear, but of power and of love and of a sound mind. And then he tells us in verse 6 to stir up the gift that is in us. And of course, uh, as I mentioned before, uh, Mr. John Meekin's article in the uh, May-June 2022 Living Church News, Stir Up the Holy Spirit, and on page 6 of the May-June 2022 Living Church News. So if you've not read that, you need that. So you need to stir up uh, God's Holy Spirit or, or fan the flame, as one of the translations have it. We need to be filled with God's Holy Spirit, and we have that power. Turn to Romans, the 8th chapter. Yes, we can overcome with the power of God's Holy Spirit. Romans, the eighth chapter, and here is a very encouraging uh, verse in Romans, eighth chapter. And verse 38, Romans 8, the whole course, this is called the Holy Spirit chapter, and uh, you may want to, as a result of the sermon or afterwards or a study, uh, read the whole chapter. Read all of Romans 8 chapter and read it slowly and mark it. But Romans 8 and uh, verse 38. For I am persuaded that neither death nor life nor angels or principalities or powers or things to come or things present nor height or depth nor every living creature created thing shall be able to separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus. Of course, and he says that we are more than conquerors than through him that loved us. So we thank God for the power that he gives us. And I, my eye doesn't fall on that scripture, but it's here somewhere. Oh, yes, verse 37. Yet in all these things we are more than overcomers. We're more than conquerors. We're more than victorious. We are more than conquerors through him who loved us. And that's through the spirit of power. Yes, we can overcome. And what do we need to overcome? Of course, we need to overcome self, the Satan, and society. I mean, that's what I was thinking about in uh, Mr. Weston's sermon I was listening to in the car yesterday on the two ways of life. And, um, of course, he said, what is the false god? What is the most 
prominent God, a false God that people have. He said, I was thinking about it and yet came to the answer it's self. Uh, self is the greatest God, a false God for most carnal human beings. And of course that's selfish, the, the two different ways of life, the way of get and the way of give. So God wants us to become a new person, a new created. And so how do we have that power to overcome with God's spirit in us? Turn to uh, Colossians, the third chapter. Colossians, the third chapter. And this is a theme that, of course, Dr. Meredith emphasized for many, many years. Colossians, the third chapter. We'll start with uh, verse 12. Colossians 3, and we'll start with uh, verse 12. Therefore, as the elect of God, holy and beloved, put on tender mercies, kindness, humility, meekness, long-suffering, bearing with one another, and forgiving one another, if anyone complain against another, even as Christ forgave you, so you also must do. But above all these things, put on love, which is the bond of perfection. And let the peace of God rule in your hearts, to which also you were called in one body, and be thankful. Let the word of Christ dwell in you, richly in all wisdom, teaching and admonishing one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing with grace in your hearts to the Lord. Let Christ dwell in you richly with all wisdom. If you haven't underlined that in your Bible, if you're marking your Bible, you want to mark that. Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly with all wisdom admonishing one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing with grace in your hearts to the Lord. And whatever you do, in word or deed, do all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father through him. So again, God wants us to do all things in the name of Christ. He's given us awesome spiritual power. And perhaps you have some of those memorized verses. I mean, we have a a little uh, uh, a memento that was given to us at the feast one year uh, on uh, Philippians 4.13. How, how many of you uh, know what Philippians 4.13 is? See your hands, okay. Okay, I can't see all your hands, but a few. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. Yes, I can overcome the world, self, Satan, and society through Christ who strengthens me. So sometimes when you're feeling weak and you feel like you can't meet the challenges that you're facing, remember some of these promises that God gives you. In James, Philippians 4.13, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. And here's another one of my favorite promises. I, I don't claim it that often, but uh, 1 John 4 and verse 4, if you turn back there, 1 John 4 and verse 4. Uh, years ago, it was kind of a jazzy uh, religious pop tune uh, that put this in kind of a, a jazz uh, beat to it. 1 John 4 and uh, verse 4. You are of God, little children, and have overcome them, that is, the Antichrist, because... He who is in you is greater than he that is in the world. Uh, the song went, he that is in you is greater than he that is in the world. Something along, along that beat along that line. But isn't that an amazing promise? Isn't that an amazing truth? Greater is he that is in you than he that is in the world. And of course, James gave us a promise. Resist the devil and he will flee from you. And 1 John says, you young men are strong. You have overcome the evil one because the word of God abides in you. Yes, that is something that Dr. Meredith talked about with Galatians 2.20. But Christ lives in me. In the life I now live in the flesh, I live by the faith of the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. And so you have Christ living his life in you. Greater is he that is in you than he that is in the world. First John 4, 
and verse 4. It's so encouraging and such a wonderful promise that God gives us. So we see that God has given us the power to overcome. I've mentioned aspects of God's Holy Spirit, the power that God gives us. I want to conclude with, conclude, we're just halfway through, uh, seven powerful strategies in overcoming. And I've just given you number one. Use your spiritual power. Strategy number one in overcoming, the power to overcome. Use your spiritual power. Be not drunk with wine, but be filled with the spirit, we read. Strategy number two, and this is more of a practical nature of overcoming, set goals for 2022 and beyond. We've had uh, quoted to us in the articles and sermons recently, Proverbs 22 and verse 3. A prudent man foresees evil and hides himself, but the simple pass on and are punished. That's Proverbs 22, 3. And it's also repeated in Proverbs 27 and verse 12. A prudent man foresees evil and hides himself, but the simple pass on and are punished. And of course, Mr. Weston, even in this article on keep your lamp filled with oil, is talking about being prepared for special times that are ahead. He says here on page two, in addition, the church has for decades encouraged members to set aside moderate amounts of emergency supplies, such as food, water, batteries, and cash. But there is something in human nature that thinks nothing will happen to me. I still have time. So we've been exhorted to plan ahead. And Proverbs 27, 12, and 22, 3 help us to do that. Planning ahead also, we use calendars. We're already planning ahead for the Feast of Tabernacles. Uh, most of you have already uh, registered for the feast. And my wife and I are going to uh, St. Augustine, Florida. And as you know, it's been announced that we have a, a could use some more uh, Visitors staying at the resort because the resort people have stayed outside of the resort area, but we need to make a room block at uh, St. Augustine, Florida. So uh, if you would like to attend there, uh, you can check and see about staying in the resort. And uh, we needed more visitors to St. Augustine, Florida. But you've been planning ahead, and that's part of overcoming because you have vision, your your avoiding the evil that is to come. We have the Feast of Trumpets coming up uh, September 26th. I hope that's on your calendar. That's just uh, 13 weeks away. And then the Day of Atonement on October 4th and the Feast of Tabernacles, of course, on October 9th. So we're all looking forward to that. You plan ahead and we're coming up with the adventure camps for some of the, the youth and the... Um, the major uh, living youth camp in Texas coming up, some preteen camps uh, coming up as well. So plan ahead. And of course, that comes down to that one scripture, uh, Proverbs 3, verses 5 and 6. Uh, I remember it was one of the living youth camps. The, uh, the teenagers had a, uh, a, 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 toast, a topic session. And uh, the question was, what is your favorite scripture? And one of the young ladies got up and quoted Proverbs 3, verses 5 and 6. Trust in the Lord with all your heart. Lean not to your own understanding. Acknowledge him in all your ways, and he will direct your paths. And of course, that's still uh, to my, today one of my favorite scriptures because I apply it. Uh, my wife says, oh, let's pray about that. I said, oh, okay, <laughs> okay. And we're going shopping or whatever we're going to do. I don't know how many prayers we give and acknowledging in all our ways. Obviously, you don't have to acknowledge every routine thing you do. Uh, but if you're going to do some kind of adventure or some new new project, uh, you need to acknowledge God and he will direct your paths. And sometimes when we fail, it's because we've not acknowledged God in all our ways. And so we want to plan and set goals for 2022 and beyond. And of course, Jesus came that we might have life and have it more abundantly. So pray for an abundant life through the next year and beyond. And of course, that abundant life comes by the way of 
give, not the way of get, but by way of serving. And we appreciate uh, so many of you here in the congregation that are serving and uh, ushering a PA system and, and uh, even in your, your congregational singing. So we, all of us are servants. We're called to be servants, a bond service, doulos, actually uh, translated slaves in, in so many cases. So we're slaves to God, not slaves to sin. But thank you for all those who are, are serving here in the local congregation and in the various clubs and in the various uh, uh, TWPs we have and special occasions. Thank you very much for that. So number two is plan ahead wisely. And um, I just read, of course, from uh, Mr. Weston in the, the uh, Living Church News, be prepared. So we need to set goals, and of course there are more than the social goals as well. Uh, the Bible study course, I just got a couple copies of the printed edition of the lessons one through four and lessons five through uh, eight, and I've just been reading through them. They're just so inspiring. Uh, the Tomorrow's World Bible study course, I hope that uh, all of you will, if you've not taken it, take it online or, or take the hard copy. Uh, just so, so very inspiring. But there are other types of goals, of course, professional goals, uh, social, musical, environmental goals, uh, educational goals, uh, family goals. Of course, you'll be uh, traveling as a family to the feast. Uh, so many different goals to set for 2022 and beyond. And of course, in our high inflation rate, we need to be careful and, and as a family figure out how can we save uh, money? How can we economize in this high inflation economy? We have to be very careful and be diligent to be our work. Jesus said in John 9 in verse 4, I must work the works of him that sent me while it is day. The night is coming when no one can work. As I am, as I am in the world, I am the light of the world. So John 9 and verse 4, Christ said, I must work the works of him that sent me while it is day. Proverbs 18, 9, on setting goals and the way we work. He who is slothful in his work is a brother to him who is a great destroyer. That's Proverbs 18, verse 9. Proverbs 27, verse 23. Be diligent to know the state of your flocks and attend to your herds. For riches are not forever, nor does a crown endure to all generations. So be diligent to know the state of your flocks. Uh, how much food do you have in the cabinet? And, and uh, what, what do you have in that closet? And what do you have down in the basement? Be diligent to know the state of your flocks and the, look forward to your herds and attend to your herds. So be a faithful steward. We have a sermon number 513, Are You a Faithful Steward? And by the way, uh, when we mention sermon titles, you can just go to members.lcg.org and in the search box at the upper right hand corner, just type in the title of the sermon. Uh, God's Master Plan, for example, as I, I mentioned earlier. So set goals for 2022 and 2023. Calvin and Hobbes were talking about making New Year's resolutions, and we resolve, that is, we make goals in our life, not just uh, on, let's say, in the springtime when the new calendar begins, say, God's sacred calendar begins. But Calvin and Hobbes were talking about resolutions. And Hobbes says to uh, Calvin, are you making any resolutions for the new year? And Calvin says, yeah, I'm resolving to just wing it and see what happens. <laughs> and so uh, Hobbes says to him, so you're staying the course? And Calvin says, I stick to my strengths. Yeah, I'm just going to wing it. I'm not going to apply the seven laws of success, of setting goals, of education, of preparation, of good health, of drive, resourcefulness, and acknowledging God in all his ways. I'm just going to wing it. So... So we do need to make plans. So, of course, the greatest goal we set 
is Matthew 6.33. And that's uh, something that it should be a heart and core of your very character and of your commitment in life that you've set that as a goal. So think of all the goals that you can set. Plan wisely. As a, one of my personal lessons or one of my personal, uh, I guess, uh, mantras, you might say, is plan wisely and execute effectively. That's what I try to apply in my, my daily life. So brethren, treasure the gifts that God has given you and multiply those gifts and set goals for 2022 and beyond. Strategy number three is learn lessons from 2021. So are there lessons that you should learn? Of course, we have many articles on the lessons of history. Dr. Douglas Winnale has written several articles on that. And you realize I've been for for many years now, writing little lessons in my week at a glance booklet and, and uh, 2020, uh, 20, 2201, lesson one for 22, I wrote down, write it down. Because at my old age, I tend to forget a, a thought comes into my mind and then it disappears. Oh, what was that I wanted to do? Well, write it down. Um, 2202. Uh, no, I won't share that one with you, but anyway. Uh, what lessons have you learned? What life lessons have you learned? We've all gone through various trials. I've, I've had many years without surgery, and now on age 85, I had two surgeries. We go through life, and we go through trials and tests, and we learn lessons from those, those tests, as Dr. Meredith said in his last years of life, he wanted to learn every lesson he could learn that he needed to learn before he would die. And so hopefully you are learning those lessons as well. So the strategy number three is learn lessons from 2021, 2022, and learn the lessons of life. Are you a loving person? And of course, Belshazzar did not learn that lesson when he saw the handwriting on the wall Daniel said to Belshazzar, Daniel 5, verse 22, but you, his son, Belshazzar, have not humbled your heart, although you knew all this. Belshazzar knew the history of what happened to Nebuchadnezzar, that he was like in a wild animal for seven years, and yet he did not learn that lesson of history, and so he paid the penalty for it and the consequences of the handwriting on the wall. And so we have an article on Tomorrow's World magazine, The Handwriting on the Wall. Dr. Douglas Rennell wrote, while critics dismiss these accounts of the fall of Babylon in, as irrelevant to nations in the 21st century, more astute thinkers offer a different perspective. The Spanish philosopher George Santiago once said, quote, those who cannot remember the past are condemned to repeat it. Those who do not remember the past are condemned to repeat it. In other words, if we fail to learn the lesson of history, we are bound to repeat the mistakes of history. Social critic On Guinness put it this way, quote, a generation that fails to read the signs of the times may be forced to read the writing on the wall. And that's from the American Hour, uh, page 414. And so we need to learn the lessons of the past. We do have uh, sermon number 856, uh, learning lasting lessons of life. So what personal lessons have you learned? What lessons could you share to our younger generation that are lessons of life? And so the apostle Paul learned the lessons of life and you know in 2 Corinthians, the 12th chapter, you turn there, 2 Corinthians, the 12th chapter, he went through all kinds of trials and tests and sufferings. Second Corinthians chapter 12. And here he sought God for the healing apparently of his eyes. And he said in tr chapter 12, Second Corinthians verse seven, unless I should be exalted above measure by the abundance of the revelations a thorn in the flesh was given to me, a messenger of Satan to buffet 
me, lest I exalt it above measure. Concerning this thing, I pleaded with the Lord three times that it might depart from me. And some of you have probably done that with some of your ailments and handicaps. And he said to me, my grace is sufficient for you, for my strength is made perfect in weakness. Therefore, most gladly, Paul says, I will rather boast in my infirmities that the power of Christ may rest upon me. I will boast in my infirmities that the power of Christ may rest upon me. So he said later on, for when I am weak, then I am strong. So we need to learn the lessons of history and God will help us to overcome as we overcome. And he's promised, of course, not to allow us above what all that we are able to resist in 1 Corinthians 10 and verse 13. But with the temptation, will also make a way of escape that you may be able to bear. That's 1 Corinthians 10 and verse 13. So how can you overcome in the next few months and years? Learn lessons from the past. Learn daily lessons and trust Christ to bring you through your trials as he did through the Apostle Paul. That when I am weak, then I am strong that the power of Christ may rest upon me. So strategy number three is learn lessons from last year's experiences, learn lessons of life. Strategy number four is see the big picture. Israel got distracted. They forgot God's power, the seventh day of unleavened bread at the Red Sea. And of course, there were the complaints from Dathan and others who said, no, oh, we should have died in the wilderness. It would have been better for us to die in the wilderness or serve the, uh, serve the Egyptians, that is, than to die in the wilderness. Uh, but Moses told them to stand still. God said, do not be afraid, stand still and see the salvation of the Lord. So sometimes we need to stand still and submit to God's, God's decision and judgment, whether we suffer a little longer, as in the Apostle Paul, or though, then later on he told them, what are you standing there for? Go forward into the Red Sea or the base of the Red Sea. So there are times when we need to stand still. There are times when they need to go forward. And we need to make sure that we're seeing the big picture. But the Israelites lost sight of the big picture. They could only see what was in front of them. And when the 12 spies went into the promised land, who, who said, we can overcome? It was Numbers chapter 13 and verse 30. It was Caleb, the spy, who said, we are well able to overcome it. That's Numbers 13, verse 30. All the other spies, except, of course, Joshua, all the other uh, spies, oh, the giants are too big. You know, we can't, we can't overcome them. But Caleb said, we are well able to overcome them. Not, of course, by his own strength, because he knew the God of Israel was behind them. So turn to Proverbs, this, uh, it's Proverbs, Philippians, uh, the second chapter, Philippians 2. And, of course, because they did not go forward and overcome them with God's help, they were confined to 40 years in the wilderness. Philippians 2 and verse 14. What did the Israelites do? They murmured and complained. I think our, our children's Bible class knows Philippians 2 verse 14 by heart. Do all things without complaining and disputing. Do all things without complaining and disputing. Some of the other translations have it. Do all things without murmurings and disputing. That's the King James Version. The NIV, do everything without grumbling or arguing. The NRSB, do all things without murmuring and arguing. And so it's okay, of course, to describe the problem. They're not saying, I'm not complaining, I'm just telling you. Uh, <laughs> we had the one uh, resort area, we were up in uh, New York, in Kingston, New York, with uh, John McNair, 
uh, during one of the days of unleavened bread. And there were people staying in, in cabins and the shower water was ice cold. So you don't say, well, uh, they, they did not complain. They just wanted to describe the problem. Yes, the, uh, the shower water is ice cold. So uh, I'm not complaining. I'm just describing the problem. But what's the solution? So you can describe the problem uh, as long as you're trying to find a solution. But notice in verse 12, Proverbs 2, uh, 2 and verse 12. Therefore, my beloved, as you have always obeyed, not as in my presence only, but now all much in my absence, work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. And that's what all of us have been doing as we go through trials and tests. Work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. How do you do that? Verse 13, for it is God who works in you both to will and to do for his good pleasure. It's a promise I claim quite often. As God gives you the power to overcome, for it is God who works in you both to will and to do his good pleasure. You may be weak-willed, but God can strengthen your will to be more courageous and to go forward and to do the things you need to do. There's one other promise you might want, some of you have already claimed, that's Isaiah 26 and verse 3. He will give you perfect peace for those whose mind is on God. And so uh, when you're going through turmoil, uh, God says there is a promise for perfect peace in Isaiah 26 and verse 3. As long as your mind is stayed on God, you're looking up to God's throne and you realize here is the center of the universe. This is where the word, Jesus Christ, upholds the universe by the word of his power. Yes, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. So always keep your eyes on the big picture and realize that yes, God's kingdom is coming. And we are bound for the promised land. I always think about the days of unleavened bread. We are bound for the promised land, uh, an Exodus song. So, yes, God has given us the promise of the promised land, and he's promised us salvation as long as we remain faithful and yielded. So number four, see the big picture. Number five, carefully follow Christ's leadership. And that's a problem several in the church have had over the years. And of course, the Apostle Paul said in 1 Corinthians 11, verse 1, follow me as I follow Christ. And as long as we learn that lesson, as we learn, we learn to follow the pillar by the cloud by day and the pillar of fire by night, we're following Christ all along. Yes, we can follow and obey him and know that it, as Mr. John Strange said in the service, it's just not church government. It's God's government. And we are being trained as kings and priests as a part of that world ruling service and government to bring world peace to the world. And we're learning how to follow instructions, to be submissive, how to serve, how to be organized, how to do it God's way. And of course, the pillar of fire and the cloud by day uh, led the Israelites all that time. Turn to Hebrews, the 13th chapter, Hebrews 13. I know this is uh, one of the guidelines God gives us as we submit to his way, his will, and his government, and his church. Hebrews 13, verse 7. Remember those who have the rule over you who have spoken the word of God to you, whose faith follow, considering the outcome of their conduct. Uh, one of the rebels years ago said, oh, well, that doesn't mean who have the rule over you. The other translation is who are the guides. Oh, well, does it say? Remember those who are the guides, not resist them and not reject them. And then, of course, verse 17, obey those if you want to say, oh, they're not the rule over you, they're the guides. Well, what does it say? Obey those who have the rule over you and be submissive for, so they work out for your souls 
that they must give account. Let them do it with joy and with grief, for that will be unprofitable for you. So Mr. Weston gets the counsel from many different men. We have a wonderful advice and counsel and the multitude of counselor of safety, the Proverbs tell us. And so that's why we have a counsel uh, to give Mr. Weston good, good advice and wise advice. And he has the final decision. And we know that God is blessing the work. In fact, the um, August uh, Tomorrow's World magazine, I don't know if I have a copy here. Oh, this is the August uh, Tomorrow's World magazine, August 2022. Uh, you'll be getting that in a couple, uh, in a week or so in your mailbox. At, uh, the Transformation of Germany, uh, Sabbath Rest, A World Deceived. So you'll be getting that magazine. This magazine has a circulation of 588,000. Even though we're having a renewal program, reducing those readerships that are not really interested, we're still increasing up to 588,000. And of course, uh, I think uh, Mr. Weston mentioned in his update about over 600,000 when we consider the various translations of the magazine and. Uh, Afrikaans and, uh, and French and in Spanish as well. So we need to respond to Christ's leadership. And uh, of course we have the LCN article. Um, I won't ask you to raise your hand because I can't see you out there anyway as well. Um, Janth English article on woman to woman in the LCN magazine. Submission is not a dirty word. So we just read, of course, uh, Ephesians uh, was it 5, 521, submitting one to another in the fear of God. Ephesians 521, we've read that a couple times today already. And so if she has that article. If you've not, ladies, if you've not read Woman to Woman, that was in the, um, I don't have the magazine, uh, Woman to Woman article, Submissive, Submission is Not a Dirty Word by Janth English. Uh, so hope you're reading that. And yes, we want to find out where Christ is leading. We heard that comment in the announcements here today. How do you know where Christ is leading? Well, you're reading what Mr. Weston writes in the uh, editorials for the Living Church News and in the Tomorrow's World magazine. And in the June 15th co-worker letter, I hope uh, you've responded to that. I try to encourage those of you who use envelopes and checks to or put a, maybe a dollar or two or ten dollars or a hundred dollars in the co-worker letter you're responding. You're listening to where Christ is leading. Jesus said, my sheep hear my voice and they follow me. That's John 10 and verse 27. So I hope that you're responding to the co-worker letter, uh, whether you're doing it electronically or putting something in an envelope and sending it on to headquarters. So remember that you're following the example of Christ in his foot washing and we follow that example in following God's government in responding to a church organization and administration and so we know that Christ loved us and gave himself for us but it says in Revelation 1 and verse 5 to him who loved us and washed us in his own blood and has made us kings and priests to his God and Father. To him be glory and dominion forever and ever. He said he's made us kings and priests. So we are going to be a part of that government. And thank God for Christ who is king of kings and lord of lords who's coming. And he is also called our keeper. It is, is amazing. Of course, uh, Psalm 121, I think some of you know that. I I recite it often, and I realize what awesome promises are even in Psalm 23. He says that he leads us in the paths of righteousness for his name's sake. You realize that's one of the promises in Psalm, leads us in the path of righteousness. I do things that are wrong all the, all the time, not all the time, but every once in a while. Uh, please lead me in the right path. And he gives us that promise in Psalm 23. And he tells, not only is it our shepherd, but in Psalm 20, 121 and verse 4, he says, Behold, he who keeps Israel shall neither slumber nor sleep. 
The Lord is your keeper. Did you realize not only is the Lord your shepherd, the Lord is your keeper. Psalm 121 and verse 4. The Lord is your shade at your right hand. The sun shall not smite you by day, nor the moon by night. The Lord shall preserve you from all evil. He shall preserve your soul. The Lord shall preserve your going out and your coming in from that time forth and even forevermore. <laughs> I go back to that same, same experience back in uh, Virginia Beach, Virginia, where I had the Proverbs 15.1 experience. I was memorizing this poem about he shall bless your going out and your coming in. And I came back to my apartment and I didn't have the key. And I said, well, and the landlady was not there. And I said, well, how can I get in? And I said, God, you promised me to let my, get, my going out and my coming in and I can't come in. I kindly figured a way to go through kind of a basement way and there was a door into the house that had a latch and I got a card and put the latch and I got into the house in a secret way. He blessed my going out and my coming in even when I wasn't able to come in. But I claimed that promise and got into the house. Anyway, but we already read in Hebrews the 12th chapter that we are looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith. So God's form of government is God's way of life. So number five, carefully follow Christ's leadership. Carefully follow Christ's leadership. Number six, practice the attitude of thanksgiving. Of course, we had the November, December article. We had an article in the November, December LCN on in everything give thanks, which is 1 Thessalonians 5, verse 16. Rejoice always, pray without ceasing. In everything give, give thanks, for this is the will of God in Christ Jesus for you. How many times a day do you give God thanks? In everything give thanks. And we also read Colossians 3. And let the peace of God rule in your hearts to which you were called in one body and be thankful. That's Colossians 3 and verse 15. So we have here on number six, practice thanksgiving. Practice an attitude of thanksgiving. And number seven, remember your spiritual identity. Who are you? You are begotten sons and daughters of the Almighty. As it tells us in 2 Corinthians 6, and verse 18, you are members of the body of Christ and you are the temple of the living God. So it tells us in 2 Corinthians 6 and verse 16, can you think of other identities that God has called you? Christ is a vine and we are the branches. And here it is our Father glorified that we bear much fruit. It tells us in John 15 and verse 8. So we are branches of the vine, and then we are to bear much fruit. We're ambassadors for Christ, 2 Corinthians 5 and verse 20. We are servants, do laws. We are saints of God, and we are the body of Christ. We're disciples, that is, students of Christ. We are sheep. And we realize that, yes, that he loves us as the very body because we are the bride of Christ and are looking forward to the wedding. So remember who you are as you cultivate, cultivate that intimate relationship with God the Father and with Christ. We pray for one another because we are all members of that family, as it tells us in Ephesians 3, 14, and 15, that God is the Father of whom the whole family in heaven and earth is named. So pray for one another and realize, yes, we are the bride of Christ. And that tells us in Revelation 19, verse 7. So number seven, remember your spiritual identity. So brethren, we have an awesome privilege of being members of the very body of Christ. We've been by one spirit have we been baptized into one body. And as members of the body of Christ, we have a major responsibility 
to grow in the grace and the knowledge of Christ. We must grow in that unleavened attitude to put out the leaven of malice and wickedness and eat the unleavened bread of sincerity and truth. We're replacing carnal nature with God's divine nature. We're looking for the promised land and the Israelites did not follow Christ, but God is giving us the leadership to follow him. And my sheep hear my voice and they follow me as Jesus said. And we all need to, as we've learned, to maintain an attitude of repentance. As Dr. Meredith wrote, one of the greatest characteristics of conversion is the ability and willingness to be corrected and to realize, yes, I may be wrong. I need to change something in my life. I need to learn the lessons that I should have learned before and I have to learn the hard way. So maintain that attitude of repentance. Be willing to learn, have that teachable attitude. So in the years ahead, perilous times are coming as we read in 2 Timothy, the third chapter. He's training us to be kings and priests and judges in his kingdom. And we need to go, need to be overcoming with the power of his spirit. Today, we've talked about seven keys or strategies of overcoming and fulfilling the day of, uh, days, of unleavened bread, uh, days of unleavened bread meaning. Number one, use the gift of God's spiritual power. Two, plan ahead, set goals for 2022 and 2023. Three, learn the lessons from 2021 and learn the lessons of life. Number four, see the big picture, visualize the kingdom and practice enthusiasm in your daily exodus. We are bound for the promised land. Number five, carefully follow Christ's leadership. Number six, practice an attitude of thanksgiving. Number seven, remember your spiritual identity and realize as Mr. Armstrong wrote in his last letter, January 10th, 1986, he said, Continue to sacrifice through 1986 to finish the commission God has given his church. The greatest work lies yet ahead. We brethren are actively dedicated to doing the work. As Jesus said, my food is to do the will of him that sent me and is finish his work, John 4 and verse 34. We need to pray for more laborers into the harvest, Matthew 9 verses 37 and 38. And we've hired 12 ministers over the past year, and we need even more laborers to go into the harvest. So let's bear much fruit. And remember, we can do all things through Christ who strengthened us. Respond to the coworker letter. Respond and read the Tomorrow's World magazine. Re re read the Living Church News articles. And remember that you are called to be a member of the the, the kingdom of God as a king and a priest and as a wife of Jesus Christ. So let's learn the lessons of Passover, the days of leavened bread and Pentecost and realize as it tells us in Revelation 21, 7, he, oh, oh, he who overcomes shall inherit all things. Revelation 21, 7, he who overcomes shall inherit all things and I will be his God, and he shall be my son. So brethren, we must overcome every day. We must grow in the grace and knowledge of every, every day we can. Uh, Jesus said in John 16, 33, in the world you will have tribulation, but be of good cheer. I have overcome the world. So let's follow Christ and realize as it tells us in Philippians 4.13, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens us. We must be overcomers. We are the church of the forgiven. Pray that we can be the church of the overcomers. Let's do the work of God, fulfill the great commission, and be overcomers who will rule with the Father and with Christ for all eternity. Thank God for the power to overcome.